Thank you for joining us today for our discussion on Jürgen Moltmann, Theodicy, Hope, and the Crucified. I am Dr. Dustin Bird, Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the University of Olivet, as well as the founder of Ekparosis Press and the founder and co-director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. For those of you who aren't familiar with Jürgen uh, Moltmann, Moltmann was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1926 to an irreligious family. As a youngster, Moltmann adored Albert Einstein and looked to study mathematics at university. However, in 1943, at the age of 16, he was drafted into the German military, wherein he served in an anti-battery unit defending his hometown of Hamburg from British bombing. Later, he was reassigned to the Clever Reichswald, an imperial forest in North Rhine-Westphalia near the Dutch border, wherein in 1945, he would surrender to British forces. From 1945 to 1948, he was a prisoner of war in Belgium, Scotland, and England. As a POW, he was assigned to Klimarnock, Scotland, to help rebuild what was destroyed in the war. It was there that he first confronted the horrors of the Holocaust, as pictures of the concentration camps were deliberately nailed to the POW's domiciles. Moltmann reacted to those pictures, understanding that he was part of the machine that created such horror and terror. Subsequently, he was given a New Testament and Psalms by an American chaplain. In reading the book of Matthew, he found Jesus on the cross exclaiming, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Somehow he found Jesus' lamentation confronting, comforting in his own time of suffering and tribulation. In 1946, at Camp Norton in Cuckney in, in the UK, he discovered Reinhold Niebuhr's book, The Nature and Destiny of Man, which he said changed his life forever. His post-war experiences, especially in relation to the horror and terror he experienced within the war, led him to study theology at the University of Göttingen, associated with the Confessing Church in Germany. Upon receiving his doctorate in 1952, he served as a pastor for students and a theology lecturer. In 1963, he joined the theology faculty at the University of Bonn in West Germany, and in 1967, he became a professor of systematic theology at the University of Tübingen, where he remained until his retirement in 1994. After retirement, he continued to write, lecture, and serve in a wide variety of capacities in religious communities and organizations. On July 3rd, 2024, just recently, he passed away, leaving behind his four children, whose mother, Elizabeth Moltmann Wendel, a notable feminist theologian, had passed away already in 2016. <laughs> Moltmann was the author of numerous books, including his most influential a trinity of books, The Theology of Hope, published in 64, the Crucified God, published in 62, The Church and the Power of the Spirit, published in 60, or excuse me, 75. These books had a lasting effect on Reformed theology, but also influenced Catholic and Orthodox approaches to modern theology. More than anything else, his theology is anticipatory. It expresses a deep-seated longing for the kingdom of God, an end to suffering, misery, and the horror and terror of nature and history. It is a liberation theology that is truly theological, as opposed to a political philosophy camouflaged by theological concepts. Nevertheless, his theology had political and social implications, which he often talked about in his numerous public speeches. To talk to us today about Jürgen Moltmann is Dr. Rudolf Sievert, whose early life and career parallels much of Moltmann's. Both lived in the Third Reich. Both were drafted into the German military during World War II. Both defended their cities during the saturation bombings. Both were later captured and interned as POWs. Both were later returned to Germany and studied theology, and both were professors within the realm of religious studies. Dr. Siebert is Professor Emeritus of Religion and Society at Western Michigan University, where he taught for 54 years, beginning in 1965. He is the author of over 30 books, hundreds of articles, the founder and director of the Institute for Future Studies at Western Michigan University, and the founder and director of two international courses in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and Yalta, Ukraine. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. You're welcome. So in studying Moltmann's biography, I was very struck by the similarities of your early life in Germany and, and his as well, yours in Frankfurt and his in Hamburg. 
beyond what I already spoke of, how did the experience of fascism living in the Third Reich, participating in, in the war, being a POW, how did those influence yours and Moltmann's uh, religious outlooks? Well, I would say what we really have in common was that we were very early, we were only 14 years old or 15 years old, that we got confronted with the negative, with the negative in history, with the horror of the negative. So in Hamburg, he was in the Air Force and he was involved in the special bombing of uh, Hamburg because the British had uh, this, uh, had uh, captured a radar instrument of the German Air Force and found out that the radar could not differentiate between silver paper and the walls of airplanes. And so they threw down silver paper on one side of, uh, of uh, Hamburg and all the defense that was directed against it. And then they flew in from the opposite side and annihilated the whole city. So he had this experience of the negative in the form of this air war. And then he, like me, he joined the army, but um, I don't know if he was really engaged in any kind of a battle. So for me, the negative appeared in the battle of Aschaffenburg, um, where of course the um, American army had conquered the um, defenses on the other side of the Rhine. And were not expecting that there was another defense line which went through Aschaffenburg and to Nuremberg. And uh, so this was a great surprise and of course brought the morale of the American troops down because they had expected it's all over and there it started again. And the casualties of the American army were double the casualties of the German army in the battle of Aschaffenburg. So it was a beastly and completely unnecessary event in which I experienced the negative of the historical process, because that is what Moltmann was all about, the negation of the negation and the affirmation, the hope in the despair of all that what we had experienced. And so in order to understand him and see the context in which he operated, he uh, was not religiously educated in his family. He uh, came into a horrible psychological crisis in prison and uh, the, what got him out of it was a group of uh, Christians who then led him into, into Christianity in which he found hope in his horrible despair. But in a wider context, he belonged to the Hegelian left. So the greatest philosopher of modernity, Hegel, had followers, uh, fo followers on the left, in the center, and on the right. So he was not uh, situated on the right or in the center, but he was led into the Hegelian left. And so through the Hegelian left, he also became familiar with Hegel. And uh, in Hegel, he was interested in Hegel's early religious writings, then in Hegel's phenomenology of the mind, and then particularly in his philosophy of history and also in his philosophy of uh, religion. And then in philosophy of religion, he found Hegel's statements on the crucified God and uh, the negation of the negation through the resurrection. The resurrection was the negation of the negation, the new heaven and the new earth. That became the content of his hope for which he then lived in a very consistent way throughout his whole life and his professional career. So um, the, uh, there it was in this, on the Hegeli left then, that he um, came together with uh, uh, thinkers like uh, Marxist thinkers like Ernst Bloch, but also with Walter Benjamin and so on. So he belonged to those Protestant and Catholic theologians who dared to move into the Hegelian left. And that meant also to Marxism and it meant later on also to Freud and other psychoanalysts. Uh, so that is the context in which Moltmann could be understood. We cannot understand him without the Hegelian teaching and his whole theory of hope came immediately, of course, uh, through 
um, so this Marxist Bloch, but um, uh, further from beyond Bloch then, Bloch was also very much involved with Hegel. He compared Hegel with Beethoven, what Beethoven created in music that Hegel created in philosophy and in theology. So um, that is how he came to Hegel, who had uh, completed the uh, ontological proof of God for Anselm of Canterbury of uh, the year 1000, the tremendous turn not to approach God from the side of the world, from uh, the cosmos or from the purposiveness of uh, the world that the Greeks had too, but from a Christian point of view, namely from God's perspective, from God's subjectivity, the highest idea, higher than which we cannot think, must also contain being. That was Anselm of Canterbury's uh, uh, ontological proof of the existence of God, and that is what Hegel then completed and from which Moltmann started. So in that sense, also Hegel's philosophy was in its totality also a theodicy already. Theodicy is the beginning of all theology. Theology comes from theodicy. The question of justice of God in the face of the horrendous injustices of this, of his world, of his world, of his nature, and of his human, uh, human world. And so that is the intellectual background. Uh, it goes from Anselm of Canterbury through the great mystics, uh, like Meister Eckhart, and to, uh, through panentheism, not pantheism, but panentheism. And um, so that is the tradition in which his philosophy and, and his theology can then be understood. Anselm of Canterbury, Meister Eckhart, Hegel, then Moltmann. Yeah, it's got to be pretty jarring for a lot of people today, especially very conservative Christians, evangelical Protestants, whatnot, to hear that this great theologian was highly influenced by a, a, a Marxist philosopher like Ernst Bloch. But I think at the time that he was writing in the 1960s, this was very much a powerful movement that was going on that Christian theologians especially were talking with Marxists and taking seriously the claims of Marx, even the claims about religion, which made religious people, at least the theologians, self-reflective. Has our theology become opiate? I mean, has it become opiate? What is it doing, you know? And some took a reactionary stance, and I think Moltmann took the opposite. Let's examine that claim. Let's let's look at that. Is that who we are, right? And if it is, then what do we do about it? Right. Um, and so, I mean, it, in many ways, let me the question for you is that was there in Moltmann a genuine um, interpret or interpenetration of concepts? Uh, did did his theology become more let's say, infused with class consciousness and things like that from Marx? And did the Marxists who were his interlocutors understand the Christianity in a different light through through more of uh, Jesus suffering on the cross, the victim of the empire, for instance? Well, I mean, he belongs to this uh, enormous event of the so-called Christian Marxist dialogue, uh, which uh, happened in the 60s. And um, also, we were connected with this. Uh, um, I, but I founded this course of the future of religion in Dubrovnik because Marxists, professors from Zagreb, uh, asked me if I wanted to do that because they had, from the Frankfurt School, they had a yearly meeting north, uh, north of Dubrovnik on an island. And so they met there and then the government somehow interfered. They couldn't meet anymore. But the last meeting which they had was on religion. And so the professors from this meeting, they came to Dubrovnik and said, if I could not do what they wanted to do and couldn't do, namely to have a course or discussions on the issue of religion. So then I went to the professors in the Marxists, professors in Zagreb, and from there we organized that course, which then lasted up to now, and now in May it will continue in 
the 44th course on the future of religion, which started with this Christian Marxist dialogue, which was enormous because um, the Christians had joined the fascists in Croatia or in Yugoslavia, and a lot of murder had taken place. So it was enormous that we could do that in this wild context that we could start this Christian Marxist dialogue. And so we did it again and again every year, sometimes four weeks, sometimes three weeks, and then where we met with Marxist professors, uh, scholars, and discussed the different uh, issues. Waldman never came to Dubrovnik, but he came here to Kalamazoo. I introduced him here on K College, which was a very progressive type of college at the time. And um, so we had uh, Moltmann there. <clears throat> we had also Metz there, the Catholic uh, founder of a new political theology on the left against um, Hitler's political theologian. <clears throat> and um, then he also was the founder indirectly of the liberation the theology in Central America. So I brought Metz here together with Moltmann and then we brought also Hans Küng in, who, um, who enlightened us here. <clears throat> Hans Küng was from Switzerland and therefore grew up in a peaceful environment and did not have this confrontation with the negative as Moldman and I did. And then also Gregory Baum from Canada, the most outstanding theologian in Canada. He also came to us, so we really tried everything to enlighten the Midwest here. Uh, theologically and philosophically and, and so on. So um, that was our participation in the whole process. And Moldman was the leading figure in this process. I was listening to a uh, discussion that Moldman had so many years ago, and he was talking about how he was in the United States at a conference um, when someone came in with the news on April 4th, 1968, that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And that was a, a jarring experience for him. That was another confrontation with the negative because the hope of America that he represented, that MLK represented, had been silenced. Um, and he said that was a, a crucial turning point and motivation for him to write his 1972 book, The Crucified God. Um, what does he mean when he says the crucified God? What is the essence of, of this claim theologically? Well, the, um, his relationship to America was very peculiar because the book, um, about the future of, of, of a hope, um, was very, became very attractive here in America in the sense that we are, of, of somehow positive and, and optimistic. And uh, so uh, Moltmann found reception here, very powerful reception. His first book became very famous, very suddenly a great success, so to speak. And, uh, but Moltmann found out that that hope, which was presented here in the churches and so on, was something different than that what he had discovered. Somehow eschatology, and that is what he was concerned with, um, had been neglected somewhat in a Constantinian type of a church. That means an empire church. We thought that this Constantinian type of Christianity or Christendom was finished with the Second World War. But when you listen now to Fox News or to, or to the Eternal Word, the Catholic counterpart of it, then you see that this is still well and alive, this Constantinian Christianity, a church which becomes an empire church now, not the Roman Empire, the American Empire. <clears throat> and um, so that is very disappointing. And of course, Moltmann brought, uh, somehow actualized what we find in the Our Father, your kingdom come and uh, also, what we find in the creeds, the different Christian creeds, the hope for the coming of God, the coming of, uh, of uh, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Jesus. And so that what was so neglected became then 
the core of Moldbad's concern. And um, so the, uh, the issue with the crucified God that you would find then all in uh, Hegel's philosophy of religion, where he talks about, uh, about the development of Christianity. Moldbad and Hegel had something in common. They started, uh, Hegel was a student in a Lutheran seminary in Tübingen, but he, after the um, studies, theological studies, he was uh, overwhelmed by the Enlightenment and lost Christianity for some time. Um, Moldman did not lose it, he didn't have it in the first place. And then they both uh, discovered it, the discovery of, um, of uh, Christianity through, um, through uh, Anselm of Canterbury and through Meister Eckhart and through Hegel. And uh, so when you look at this part where he speaks about Jesus' crucifixion, there you have the uh, the uh, crucified God, with Moldman's concept, and uh, the crucified God, this, this negativity of the crucifixion, this horror and this tar is then negated through the resurrection, and uh, that it means that then something affirmative comes, a new creation, um, which Christians can hope for. And so, and, but uh, now the um, other people on the left, like for instance, Adorno and Horkheimer and so on, they had a certain hope, the hope that the German workers would overthrow Hitler and the capitalists who paid him. And their great disappointment was then that the German workers either remained neutral in the middle or that they even joined fascism, that they mixed up the counter-revolution of fascism with the socialistic revolution and was betrayed in all this, like they believe today that they all can be like Trump and can have an airplane and women and, and wealth and all this and uh, that he will give it to them. The same thing we had also in the Germ among the German workers and that the German workers, like we today, we have 150 million workers who are exploited by maybe 1 million non-workers. And um, so that the workers did not rise, that they did not turn against Hitler and against Krupp and Tussen and Ford and so on, was the great disappointment. And uh, they never lost their hope of alternative future number three. That means a reconciled society but uh, they, were, they were overwhelmed by future number one, the totally administered society, or the possibility of a war society with the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb at the end of it and so on. So uh, <clears throat> that, as far as the others were concerned. So, but there was one member of the critical theorist and that was uh, Benjamin <clears throat> and uh, Moltmann was close to Benjamin and uh, also to Sholem, who was the friend of Benjamin, <coughs> who was always afraid that uh, Benjamin was going too far to the left. And he was afraid of all the Bolshevists uh, of Horkheimer in New York and all this. So there were tensions between that. But Benjamin and uh, uh, <coughs> they were friends there. And um, so uh, th this is um, the context in which we have to see um, uh, um, our friend, he was not a member of the critical theorists as such, but he was at least in, in contact with Benjamin. Yeah, in his introduction, the crucified God, at one point in time, he basically says that, you know, he's moving from Bloch's philosophy of hope to a critical theology of the cross um, as he as he reads or as he works through Horkheimer and Adorno, especially as he talks about, um, but they're not disconnected. So he's not, it's not like he's abandoning the theology of the cross or excuse me, the theology of hope uh, for a theology of the cross, but they, you can't have one without the other. You can't understand the, the night side uh, or the day side without understanding the night side. You have to be able to see, to have hope, you have to be able to see the catastrophe um, you know, you have to have a, a God who suffers alongside the suffering if you're ever going to have hope of, of escaping the suffering through 
the resurrection of Jesus. And so it was very interesting that, you know, as I I read Moltmann a long time ago, but I, I just recently went back in preparation for this. It 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 was amazing to me to see how much of the critical theorist work of Benjamin, of Adorno, of Horkheimer is actually in Moltmann's theology and that he develops it in in a in a very Christian way. Um, and I think a much more hopeful way than than in many cases uh, Adorno and and um, and Horkheimer. I think one of the last things that Marcuse, for instance, said to Horkheimer, I think Horkheimer said, "I'm becoming increasingly stupid in my old age," and he said, "No, Max, it's not that you're becoming stupid or something. It's because the world is increasingly becoming more and more dark, uh, mm -hmm. more and more broken, more and more defined by catastrophe." I wonder if Moltmann's you know, theology of hope can withstand the the catastrophe that is the modern world today. Yeah, well, I mean, there were there were radio discussions between Bloch and and Moltmann, and they were arranged by Eugen Kogan and Walter Dix, and they were on on, on the radio and television. I, I think only on the radio. They took place in Münster and other places. And there, uh, Bloch um, was particularly concerned with this crucifixion, which Moldman presented, the crucified God. And he reminded <clears throat> Moldman of the uh, 10,000 slaves who were crucified in the Via Appia, on the way, uh, Via Appia Antigua to Rome. And he said, none of them was resurrected. And uh, so, the, the reality that the dead are really dead and that is taken seriously and that, well, Jesus died, but then after all, he was resurrected and so on. So the um, old man wanted to emphasize uh, the, um, the horror and the, um, uh, the um, representation of the negative of this world in the crucified God. And uh, so, the um, they did not really come to an understanding. <clears throat> it the um, Moltmann went the Christian way, and uh, then uh, the um, his Marxist friend never converted in any way. <clears throat> they were good friends in in Tübingen, and uh, he, Moltmann helped to uh, to publish a lot of the works of uh, <clears throat> of Bloch. Bloch had been a professor in the German Democratic Republic in Leipzig, and there he had told his students that also in the new post-capitalistic world, there would be religion, and the Marxist students didn't like that and threw him out. And that is how he came to Tübingen in the first place. <coughs> so, uh, nevertheless, the... Uh, in order to understand Moltmann important, uh, the importance and where he comes from, we have to start with this description of the crucifixion. That means the negative in this world, and that this negative is negated. And that out of this negation, there comes something affirmative. And the difficulty for the Frankfurt School people was that there was a negation of the negation. Nazism was negated in the war, but the negation of the negation did not lead to something affirmative, and that then influenced also their attitude toward the religion. That means the, the, the resurrection, but the resurrection had not brought about that affirmative, that kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, or a, a healed type of a world, but the mess went on as we see today in the Ukraine and see in Israel and, and so on. So that was the uh, great disappointment. I wonder sometimes what they would say about what is happening now in the Near East and so on, and I can easily imagine what they would say. <laughs> they would say it continues. And uh, so therefore, particularly, Adorno then said his non credo, I do not believe. He waited for a better um, revelation without so many contradictions and a revelation which would really lead to an affirmative. 
So they have the longing for the longing, the longing for the hope, but Moltmann has the real hope and there is a difference between the two. Yeah, I remember listening to Moltmann talking about when he would come to the U.S. and talk about the theology of hope. It, it just, it, like you said, they understood it differently. Like an American was somehow pathologically optimistic. And so, you know, the, the negation, they never seem to to really fully comprehend the negation or it's forgotten about it. And there's a reason why they call it the United States of Amnesia, because we forget the negation and we we lock ourselves and prison ourselves in in the in the positive. Um, and I think from Moldman, he was horrified by that. So he said that when he would come and talk to his American friends, he would only talk about the negative, the crucified God. Um, because, you know, it, it just it didn't understand. Americans did not understand the the horror and the terror uh, that is behind the positive, right? That the positive is meant to somehow negate. So one of the things that, um, you know, you're talking about the the longing uh, in the crucified God, he, he brings up <clears throat> Horkheimer's uh, essay, uh, about Dissensuch nach dem ganz anderen, right? The longing for the totally other. Um, and that somehow that is in between atheism and theism. The, the atheistic claims of look at human history, look at the horror of human history, the, 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 the hundreds and thousands of slaves that were massacred on the Via Appia, Golgotha history, as it was called, the history of suffering, um, how could there possibly a loving be a, a loving and, and and beneficent God in the face of that history in that God's world? And on on the other side, the religious side that that says something about that. No, this we have to maintain this loving God. This is a God of mercy, of compassion. Um, that somehow Horkheimer's longing for the totally other was in between this. Um, that you can't have a positive belief in that God, but you hope that God exists. Why you take seriously the catastrophe of history? Does that somehow ring true with you? Yeah. So when we look at the gravestone of uh, Horkheimer, he wrote there uh, Psalm 91, and in you, eternal one alone, I trust. And uh, that was definitely in the Jewish context. His wife converted from Anglicanism to Judaism late in life. So I think the um, uh, Horkheimer died as a Jewish believer, <coughs> um, not so Adorno. So they were very close friends, but there was a difference. And when Adorno was buried in the Frankfurt um, Cemetery, Nobody, no church representation of what was there. <laughs> Only his publisher appeared in, for the uh, funeral. <clears throat> so they, are, uh, they had a different attitude, finally, to the religious uh, situation. <clears throat> but Moltmann went his own way, and I cannot say it any better than in that formula, as um, Hegel had formulated, that the negativity of the death of God was negated by the resurrection of Christ and that the, we all can participate in this resurrection. But the resurrection does not mean return to the life as it was, <clears throat> but it means a new world, a new heaven and a new earth uh, in which this negative world now will be negated. That is the content of the hope. And so um, Moltmann argues this with different people on the left, but also on the right and in the center of Hegel as well. <clears throat> so the formula would be that his hope is a hope in the uh, negation of this negation of the crucified God. But you have to have this crucified God first, and it has to be really seriously. And you cannot say that this speculative Good Friday is just a little thing to go through, but this is fundamental, and he takes it as seriously as Adorno would do it. <clears throat> then 
it's this hope which he has of this negation of this horrible negation that this is something which he um, had in common with Christianity. <clears throat> but the Christianity, which as Constantinian Empire Church had completely neglected. Now, if this all carries or in convinces in a world which is obviously getting more and more deranged from day to day, <clears throat> that is, of course, another question. But Moldman definitely shows the way how one could possibly deal with it. Right, and it has to be dealt with using the language that he talks about in the crucified God, both with the trumpets of Easter and the lamentations of Good Friday. Yeah. That they, they both have to be there. Um, without one or the other, they become pathological in many ways. Right. Um, one of the very interesting stories that I found when I was preparing for this about Moltmann was um, talking about the movement that was happening in El Salvador in Nicaragua uh, in the 60s into the 70s and then into the 80s um, with liberation theology and that Moltmann's work had become uh, highly influential in the development of especially Latin American liberation theology. So much so that um, in, in 1989, when the six Jesuit priests uh, and their housekeeper were murdered murdered by by the Salvadorian paramilitaries in San Salvador. Um, one of the priests, um, Juan Ramon Moreno, uh, was found. His body was on his body was found a copy of Moldman's uh, Crucified God, and somehow that book, which is on display now um, in a museum down there uh, for the martyred Jesuits. Uh, that book somehow was instrumental in helping people to understand what was going on in those countries, in this case, El Salvador, with the the mass killing of, of peasants and the mass killing of, of proletarian people, uh, people who were, you could call them the salt of the earth, as, as they would find in biblically. Um, but it helped give it an explanation, understanding of God's involvement that this isn't the will of God to mass murder these people by the paramilitaries, by the dictatorship, supported and funded by the United States, but that God suffers alongside the suffering, suffers with them in, in the best sense of the word of compassion, compassio, with, or, or to suffer with. Um, and I think in a in lot of theology, there's an understanding that there's this divide between human suffering and God who's out there. And that if God is imposing suffering on people, there's a lesson to be learned. And Moltmann saying, no, God is suffering with the people at the same time. Um, is this how you see it? Yeah. So, of course, the um, this Christian Marxist dialogue, which went, you know, which we had in Yugoslavia, which we had in Europe, and which we had here, um, the... Um, Christians discovered that Marx had Christian motifs in his teaching, that he identified with the suffering, with the with the proletariat, with the slaves, with the serfs, with the wage laborers, and uh, that something very deeply Christian was in there. When Marx was critical of the opium of the people and so on, then he meant a religion which was made use of by slaveholders, feudal lords, or capitalists, as they do now, daily in the radio. It's amazing, the Republican Convention, how religious it was. Everybody had his own Bible verse, and so on. So making use of religion, and um, it's, it's a, a certain form of blasphemy, really, what is happening there. But it happened again and again that the church, instead of following Jesus, conformed to slaveholders, conformed to feudal lords, and conformed to capitalists, and distorted beyond recognition whatever Jesus had taught. It's not only that Jesus taught you should not call anybody father, you have only one father, and then they have all the fathers holy, running around, and even a holy father on top of it, and so on. So <laughs> there's this conformity, 
to systems of exploitation and at the same time a horrible distortion. Maybe no other religion has ever been so distorted as Christianity has been and is at this moment. So uh, Moltmann was aware of all of this, aware with other people on the Hegelian left, and he expressed this in something which deeply was deeply rooted in the Catholic Anselm of Canterbury, but also in the Protestant and the Lutheran Hegel. Moltmann himself was in the Calvinistic tradition, in the Bardian tradition. He was very close to Karl Barth. <coughs> also, it was not the Lutheran tradition, but the Reformed tradition in which Moltmann worked. And he uh, quotes Calvin very often, and Calvin expresses the same a uh, hope which he also emphasizes, a hope which presupposes faith and which uh, has as its result love. Love unites faith and hope. So it's those three cardinal virtues, theological virtues, which uh, Moltmann <coughs> actualized, which had somewhat been forgotten. You cannot have love without having faith and hope. You cannot have hope without faith, and you cannot have love without faith and hope. So this is, is something which uh, <clears throat> has something to do with our political world. According to the fathers of the Constitution, democracy can only work with virtuous people. <clears throat> virtuous people means people who are prudent, who are just, who are brave, who are chaste, and people who are believing, hoping, and loving. Those people alone can carry a democracy. If these people are not there, democracy will turn over in authoritarianism. And we have this great temptation of authoritarianism at this moment in Europe and also in our country. And there, Moldman can be very helpful for us to have to support the democratic resistance of the totalitarian temptation against the totalitarian temptation. Yeah, at the present moment, it looks like, especially for very conservative evangelicals supporting Trump, that love, faith, and hope have been set aside for the for Willen zu Macht, for the will to power, that power is the ultimate goal. Um, so that the, the the apparatus of the state can be used to create a country within the image uh, that that they have a very conservative evangelical Constantinian static like church, um, and and that the dictates or the contours of that church should be the dictates of the country. So power becomes the thing that that they're after more than anything else in these type of politics. Where as you said, love, faith, and hope that that's a backseat. That's something you write on the wall, you know, something you got from a, a store, love, faith, and hope, but it's not something that becomes actualized that one uh, conforms to and, and, and operationalizes within the world that's too much. Yeah, I, I think, you know, Moldman says something that the churches have become, they've made a, a, a dishonorable peace, peace with society and become sterile. Um, that they, as you said, they conform to the feudal lords and they conform to to the to, to capitalism and they conform to slavery and they conform to all these horrible things that they're no longer uh, truly an oppositional um, movement within those things. Yeah. Um, and and that is, I think what he means by that, at least from my reading of him, is that if something is to be called Christian, it has to comport to, the suffering Christ on the cross, and not the necessarily the 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 beautiful risen Jesus in the sky. Of course, that's important because that's the negation of the negation. But in order for it to be Christian, that suffering has to be comported to, um, you know. And, and I remember Dr. Cornell West some years ago said something about in America, churches are empty on Good Friday because Jesus is the loser but they are packed on Easter Sunday because he's the winner and Americans want to be identified with the winner. And from the Moltmannian perspective, it seems like one has to identify with the loser as well in order for it truly to be Christian. Right. 
So, and there we have, of course, now a very specific, specific situation, which will Moltmann and the whole Hegelian left finds itself. There was a revolution in 1917, Lenin's revolution. And Lenin's revolution had, since there had been no bourgeoisie before, they had to do what the bourgeoisie usually does. And they had to industrialize and the industrialization of Siberia and so on distracted them from the socialistic way. So that it became something like what they then called in the West right fascism. And uh, so nevertheless, this revolution was finally overcome by the neoliberal counter-revolution. And we find ourselves still in this uh, uh, counter-revolution, which was victorious, which we have to uh, accept. <clears throat> and so, but also the counter-revolution will not last forever. And the question is how we find our way out of this. But in the meantime, Trumpism is this counter-revolution. And once more, once again, under 150 million workers, like they did almost before the Second World War, um, are, in temp are tempted by going this counter-revolutionary way and taking it as a revolutionary way. And this mistake then leads to what we have seen in, in Germany and in all over Europe, <clears throat> including the... Um, movement toward the eastern border again and um, the uh, question where the uh, Slavic world ends and where the European world ends and where the debarkation line between the two is to be and this is to be decided in the Ukraine now. So <clears throat> nevertheless, um, without this context of the present counter-revolutionary situation, we cannot understand what happened to the socialistic and Christian movements in Central America and South America and <clears throat> with the left, the new left or the old left or whatever, and where they find themselves now. <clears throat> this counter-revolution has not only taken place, but it is very powerful and very attractive for large numbers of our people. And it will be decided what they will say in November. So I think in this very specific situation in which we find ourselves, Moldman can certainly show the way. He can allow us to hold on to hope in the hope that the terrible negativity can really be negated and will be negated, and that the kingdom of God is coming, that God is coming. Nothing less than this could somehow balance the horror in which we find ourselves. Yeah, the the <clears throat> one of the interesting things that I found in discussing the future and reconciliation, things like this. Um, you know, from the Marxist perspective, all of history is the history of class war, and the only way to undo the unjustness and exploitation of, of this class war is for the masses, the proletariat, the people to ultimately win over um, the ruling class, the exploiting class. And when I mean win over them, it's, it's essentially, it, it doesn't have to be, but most likely would be understood as a bloody affair, right? It's a, it's a real political revolution. Moltmann counters that with this idea of mutual liberation, wherein the oppressor and the oppressed are reconciled, not through uh, the force of arms or the masses overcoming the few, the exploited a few, um, but but as a mute, but a, how should I say, he, he says that the oppressors have to dismantle the structures of violence. Uh, and they have to liberate themselves from the very things that chain them to their exploitative natures, the, 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 the structure by which they exploit the masses. Um, and at the same time, the oppressed have to reject their oppression and cut themselves off from the oppressors. Um, to me, you know, when he wrote that mid-20th century, 
uh, looking at the the way the world is today with neoliberal capitalism, even anti-capitalists are very much a part of capitalism. Um, the left isn't really much of a thing anymore. It, it has really no institutional power, even though Fox News tells our conservatives that liberals are leftists. They're not. Um, you know, it, it seems that 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 type of human construct where there is the small few who exploit the masses is not just an industrial Western capitalist type thing now. It's globalized. And it's entrenched. And even those who try to oppose it don't really have an alternative, uh, a feasible alternative to it. It's just a, a nostalgic, you know, look at, well, well, we could always introduce this Marxism and blah, 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 and this communism. Not to say that it failed and never had a day of normal existence, but it just doesn't seem to me anymore that Moltmann's idea of a mutual liberation wherein the exploiters and the exploited emancipate themselves from those conditions is even really possible anymore. It seems utopian to use that very loaded word in the most basic sense of how people would use it as in something not feasible. What do I you think? Th I think uh, what Moltmann does, he simply translates what he found in Paul so Paul had the slave on his most, and he sent him back to the slaveholder. And he wrote, told the slaveholder, now I sent you your slave back, and if you had any losses concerning him, I'm willing to pay you for it. But remember now that your slave is now a Christian, like you are. Now that is different from Spartacus. Spartacus, a hundred years earlier, tried to march against the Roman Empire and was beaten and was crucified with 10,000 people on the Via Appia, as we said. So the Jesus way to deal with the class struggle, which, by the way, Moltmann found in Hegel's Phenomenology of the Mind, the deadly struggle between master and servant. It is all there, and Marx got it from there, and all the Marxists, and he got it from there too. So it is another way than the Spartacus way not with weapons or so, but that the both sides, the slave and the master, are transformed and therefore see each other differently, and it finally uh, will dissolve the slave way. And this is a charge against Christianity, that it ruined the Roman Empire. It ruined the Roman Empire because it dissolved the, uh, the uh, class on which the Roman Empire rested, the class of the slaves who did all the work. So it was effective. It is a, maybe a slower way and a less uh, dramatic way, but um, the uh, that people trans get transformed, the metanoia, that they begin to think in a new way. And so in that sense, Moltmann stands in the ultimate Christian tradition, the Pauline tradition, um, that this is the way to do this. Now, if this will fit, um, if the workers have not lost Christianity, maybe at least in Europe, I was very much concerned when I was a theology student and I worked as a miner and I worked in the car factories and so on. I wanted to see where the workers were standing. So the under capitalism the experiences made them less and less Christian who were the most Christian before. And so um, we don't know if the one side, the 150 million workers are willing not to go the Spartacus way, but to go the Jesus way instead. And if on the other side, the um, ruling class, which simply functionalizes religion in order to cover itself up, um, if they are willing to change their mind to go through this metanoia. Um, so that is an open question and the people have to decide and the masters have to decide and the slaves have to decide which way they want to go. So nevertheless, that is Boltmann's position concerning the class struggle. Yeah, he says that the churches are suffering through a crisis of rele relevance and credibility. Um, 
you know, and, and it, because they become, they lose their credibility, especially in, in, in Europe, they, they lose relevance. Um, they're not really part of the uh, for social forces that are trying to produce something that's a better existence for humanity or whatnot. Um, they lose credibility because they, they start to say insane things, you know, they don't, they don't listen to science, you know what I mean, whatsoever, and they become reactionary um, and, and secluded and ghettoized intellectually. Uh, and that was already a problem when he was writing in the mid uh, 20th century, at least in the 1970s, he's writing about this. And I, I think you can see it now. Um, and for instance, at the very beginning of The Crucified God, he talks about how, uh, to quote him, fundamentalism fossilizes the Bible into an unquestionable authority. Dogmatism freezes living Christian tradition solid. The habitual conservatism of religion makes the liturgy inflexible and Christian morality, often against its better knowledge and conscience, becomes a deadening legalism. So Christianity becomes static. And today now, especially where we can see it, as you were talking about in the U.S., it becomes not only static, it becomes, it, it becomes reactionary, intensely reactionary. Like the static churches are the ones that are dying off. The traditional mainline Protestant denominations, for instance, seem to be dying off. Whereas the the ones that are active are active in a reactionary way and supporting reactionary um, reactionary political movements like Trumpism, um, which which I think I think you're right when you say that it's just a, the religious aspect of it is covers it up. And in my book on Trump, I call it the gaslight gospel. I mean, it, it's not the gospel by any stretch of the imagination. It's Trump covered up with a nice Jesus persona. Um, you know, so and this is already a problem. And now in the United States, we have, I think what it is, we're for the first time under 47% of the population identifies as being religious or Christian. Uh, 47. So that's the first time where it's become the minority, less than 50. Uh, this is what's been called the great de-churching of America. And it, 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 the secularization process continues. And in part, I think, and you can disagree with me or agree with me, um, I think it has a lot to do by the churches themselves are partially responsible for the great de-churching, precisely because they either become static or reactionary. What do you think? Yeah. I think it is much worse in the sense that the, some of the churches are the conservative churches or the Christian nationalists and so on have really joined the counter-revolution um, and uh, support it. And you can just listen night after night to what Fox News and what the Eternal Word have to say. It's a continual attack against so-called Marxism and everybody's a Marxist and liberals are Marxist. And so they dissolve our country and they uh, dissolve all the old laws against uh, homosexuality and uh, all, all these issues. The, they see a whole world falling apart, and uh, the um, reason why it falls apart are the Marxists, and uh, whom they call Marxists. And um, so that is their purpose. Fascism is nothing else than a counter-revolutionary movement, and it protects capitalism. It wants capitalism to continue forever. And um, it is uh, obviously a very powerful, but a terrible distortion of what Jesus was teaching once and the hope which he gave to us, the hope of his return, the hope of the kingdom of God, which was established from the beginning and which is to come and to last forever. And um, so the question is now if uh, how many people are still uh, giving that chance to Christianity as Moldman does and as Hegel did before, who um, the, all these scholars from Hegel to Moldman foresaw the present disintegration of the civilization uh, it, it is, of course, promoted more on the democratic side and is resisted on the republican side. But on the republican side, not resisted in a very productive and honest way. So 
So Moldman is still relevant for us, I think, uh, now before the coming up election. If we can share in this hope, which he, in this faith, hope, uh, love, trinity, and some people will be able to do this and others will not, and it will come down to the numbers which we have then in November. It is an unbelievably dramatic moment in the history of America and in the history of the West. Yeah, absolutely. There's no doubt about it. This coming election 2024, and I assume some people who are going to be watching this, it'll be after November 2024, you'll already know what happened. But uh, right now in July of 2024, we're not sure what's going to happen. Will we have a not a not a restoration um, candidate, but someone who will just steer the ship as it is going. The empire will have a new manager essentially, or will it be a, a someone who <laughs> uh, ends the democratic experience in in um, experiment in in the United States? Very well, could have that as well. Um, so we're coming to our last minutes here, and I'd want to ask you one more question. Um, Moltmann was in many ways a tour de force in, in theology. And like I said, I, I not only in Protestant theology, but Catholics wrote or listened in, to him and, and read his works and contemplated what he had to say. And I even found evidence of Orthodox uh, theologians reading Moltmann and commenting on Moltmann and, 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 and being enriched by Moltmann's theology. So in your estimation, what is the what is the most essential feature of Moltmann's theology, or what 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 can someone take away that's the most important from from Moltmann? Well, Moltmann represents an essential trait in Christianity, which leads, as we said, from Anselm of Canterbury to Hegel to the present, and. Um, the question is if the West can recapture that once more and can make it alive for itself, or if the churches, because they are afraid of communism, once more, as they did in the last century, support fascism, which wants to rescue the whole system. Um, that is the question, what kind of a world do we want to live in? Will it be the capitalistic world, which finds um, war tremendously profitable and has over 20 wars since 1945, with most cruel aspects to it? Um, or will we be able to move out of this system into a newer, more humane one, that is always at stake since the Great Depression. And will this uh, New Deal, which Biden had still represented, will this be sufficient in order to settle our contradiction between the ruling class and the masses of the workers, 150 million? How will we deal with this deepening contradiction? Will be this New Deal answer still be the answer for it? Or has this contradiction gone so deep that the New Deal is not sufficient anymore? People will have to decide. <clears throat> Indeed. And um, if uh, I, it probably was a meme that I just read or saw, but uh, it said something like, if we can still say, uh, for God so loved the world, that we ought to be able to love the world as well, and not just the particularities, um, yeah. which is a difficult thing to do, of course, for a lot of people, a lot of writing by philosophers on whether that's even possible or um, whether that's even a good thing. So, But nevertheless, uh, I encourage everyone who's uh, watching this or listening to this to 
pick up a book by Jürgen Moltmann. If you are religious, not religious, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, atheist, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Moltmann uh, makes you think, makes you think hard about things, about our assumptions about the world and each other um, and what we can do uh, to make this world somehow more um, justice-filled, loving-filled, uh, faithful, and hopeful. So with that, thank you, Dr. Siebert, for joining us today. You're welcome. We are certainly, to use a good religious language, we are certainly blessed by your presence and all your knowledge. So, okay. Thank, thank you, you so very much. All right. Have a good day. You're welcome. Thank you.